Well, hello. We're here. We're cozy. We are in our Mickey blanket. Um, I edited a video for a friend this morning and had some time. So here I am to edit or to stream. Um, and you know, I was like, I was planning to probably do Captain Toad Treasure Tracker today, but to be honest, my brain is kind of tired and I have to solve puzzles in that game that I didn't feel necessarily prepared to do. Um, so I decided that, you know, the people want it, might as well start the next read stream project, which is the game, or the book that, um, uh, Danger by Design is based off of. So as you can see, the name is a little different. It's Death by Design. Um, and, uh, hang on one second. Um, and it's the 30th book in the Nancy Drew Files, which was the uh, ones that were um, published in the 80s, I believe. Let me look. Yeah, 1988, uh, that were supposed to make... One Just the one. <laughs> At Manette. Oh, yeah, I got you. Um, hey, HS, uh, and hey, Christy, by the way. Thank you both for being here. Um, so I guess these were the, the books that uh, were a little edgier. Um so that's why I feel like a lot of these have Nancy like kissing up on other dudes that aren't Ned. <laughs> so with that being said, this book is only 150 pages. And as I like to do, I like to split them into three parts. So I'll only be reading about 50 pages today, which is about five chapters of the book. So we'll stop after chapter five and then resume at some point in the hopefully near future. Um, so with that being said, um, I hope everybody has something to drink or snack on. Hopefully you can hear the music just softly behind me. If that needs to be changed, just let me know. Hello, Garrett, good morning to you. Um, PS5 was delayed and canceled, so, oh, I'm sorry, that sucks. Well, I'm hope hopefully these vibes will be cozy for you um, and uh, that you can wrap yourself in something cozy and uh, help that feel even better. I, I'm in Walmart. Want any snacks? Yes. Please pick me up um, some string cheese and grapes. I really have been wanting some grapes lately. Please, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> With that being said, we got Danger by Design music. Uh, if the music at any point is like too loud or you can't hear it at all, just like all caps me in the chat. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I'll read the back first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me clear my throat. Thank you, Tara. <clears throat> Good morning to you. <clears throat> Everything's good. Okay. After receiving a series of death threats, hot young fashion designer Kim Daly calls Nancy Drew to investigate. At first, it seems like a simple case of jealous rivals, but suddenly the competition gets murderous. Kim's pet dog is poisoned, and Nancy discovers that she too is a victim. The teen detective finds herself racing for her life. If she doesn't find an antidote for the poison fast, she'll be DOA, dead on arrival. <laughs> I like olives, uh, so olives would be fine, G, but no blue cheese, please. It's one of the few cheeses I don't like. Kimet. Yeah, I guess Kim's name, er, Minette's name is Kim. <clears throat> All right. In we jump. Chapter one. But Ned, I'm only going to be gone for a week, Nancy Drew protested. You don't really mind, do you? It was nine o'clock on a gold crane. No it was nine o'clock on a cold, gray November morning, and Nancy was just about to leave for Chicago. She cast a worried glance at her boyfriend, Ned Nickerson, who was slumped down next to her on the living room sofa. Ned's only answer was a mournful sigh. Ned, I've never seen you like this, Nancy said. I can't believe you're so upset. Ned sighed again and then abruptly straightened up. The corners of his mouth were quivering as if he were about to break into a smile. I'm just teasing you. Of course I don't mind, he said. I mean, I mind, but I understand. But since it's for a case, I'll let you go this once. I will miss you, though, he added softly, slipping his arm around Nancy's shoulder and pulling her close. 
You really had me going for a minute there. Nancy lay her head against his shoulder. I'm gonna miss you too, she said. Lifting her head for a quick kiss. It's horrible that all this had to come up when you've got a week off. Ned was home from Emerson College for a brief vacation. He'd come over to drive Nancy to the train station. But at least this case should be interesting. I don't usually get the chance to hobnob with the stars of the fashion world. How'd you get the chance to do it this time? Ned asked. Have you started advertising on TV? Nancy laughed. <laughs> Not yet. You can thank George for this one. George Fane was one of Nancy's two best friends. When she went to Chicago last week to watch those skating finals, she met Kim Daly. I don't know if you've ever heard of Kim, the fashion designer? Ned asked. That's the one. You don't wear her clothes, do you? They're too expensive for me. Besides, it's not my style. You know, everything's huge with shoulders padded out to here. Nancy held her hands out three inches from her shoulders. Kim once designed a whole line of leather skirts that you could lengthen or shorten by zipping on attachments. There were even some boots you could attach. I mean, it's great stuff to look at on someone else, but it's not the kind of thing you'd wear every day. Anyway, Nancy continued. Kim made a costume for one of the skaters and she was sitting right next to George. Kim started telling George all about some mysterious death threats she'd been getting on the phone and pretty soon George had persuaded her to call me. Kim needs me right away too, Nancy continued. She wants me to find out who's threatening her and to stop them before her big summer preview. She's gonna be one of several designers in a huge show in just a few days. Kim's the main attraction and the show could really make her reputation international. Well, don't have dinner with anyone but Bess while you're there, Ned ordered. Nancy's other best friend, Bess Marvin, was going to Chicago with her. George was on a sailing trip in the Caribbean. And keep away from those big city guys. I know how impressionable you are. Nancy picked up a throw pillow and whacked Ned over the head with it. Hey, do I lecture you about all those gorgeous cheerleaders at college? The doorbell rang before Ned could answer. Doors open, Bess, Nancy called. Come in. Bess Marvin pushed open the front door and rushed into the living room, her blonde hair peeking out of her soft pink beret. Are you ready? She asked, not waiting for a reply. Let's get to the train station before I think of anything else I forgot. I'll load the car, Nan, Ned said. Ned and Bess headed out the front door and Nancy walked to the bottom of the stairs. Dad, Hannah, I'm leaving, she called. Come say goodbye. In a second, her father came down the stairs, followed by the Drew's housekeeper, Hannah Gruen. The house is going to be much too quiet with the two of you gone. I don't know what I'll do with myself, Hannah complained. Nancy grinned. Just empty out the freezer so it'll hold all those tons of fish Dad's gonna bring home. Are you packed, Dad? Carson Drew's law practice kept him so busy he almost never found the time to take a vacation. Now at last he was getting a holiday, a long-awaited fishing trip in Canada. He smiled back at Nancy. I'm getting there. Fishing rod's in the car anyway. Then he grew serious. I just wish there was some way you could get a hold of me if you need me, Nancy. If I'd known you'd be on a case, I'd have chosen to stay someplace with a phone, not a log cabin in the middle of nowhere. But a phone would scare away all the fish, Nancy said. She gave him a quick hug. Don't worry about me, Dad. I'll be fine. And you'll call me if there's anything wrong, won't you? Hannah put in anxiously. Of course I will, but nothing's going to go wrong. Just then Ned came back. Bess is ready and raring to go, he said. Then you better get going, Nan, said her father. Come on, Hannah. I'll never finish packing if you don't help me. Nancy was grateful her father was giving her the chance to be alone with Ned for a minute before she left. What a day, Bess said more than an hour later as a blast of cold air shook the taxi she and Nancy were riding in. To their left lay the vast grayness of Lake Michigan. Above them, the sky was a sullen mass of November clouds. Once we get to that hotel, I'm staying inside, Bess continued. That wind is not going to mess up my hair. Bess, we're going to see a fashion preview, not be in it. I know, but maybe someone will discover me and make me a model, Bess said. She sneaked a glance at her reflection in the rearview mirror. If I lose enough weight, I mean. Stranger things have happened, S replied Nancy, suppressing a grin. Oh, there's our hotel, Bess said. When she'd first talked to Kim Daly, Nancy was surprised that Kim had chosen the Hamilton Hotel to set up her temporary showroom. True, the Hamilton was the site of the fashion preview, and it was one of Chicago's most elegant hotels, but it was also one of its stuffiest. Why, Nancy had wondered, would a fashion young fashion designer set up her offices there? Nancy found out why after she and Bess entered the lobby to register. The hotel had the tightest security she had ever seen. She and Bess even had to carry passes identifying them as Kim Daly's guests. To stop any unauthorized persons from seeing her designs before the show, the check-in clerk explained, it's difficult for us to keep track of everyone as you might imagine. The passes help. 
Nancy nodded sympathetically. Kim is staying here, isn't she? Oh, yes, she set up a temporary office and showroom on the 30th floor. In fact, as soon as you've settled in, she wants you to she wants to take you to lunch. Settled in? Bess glanced around the Hamilton's beautiful beautiful lobby with its pale apricot-colored marble walls and lush oriental rugs. If our room is just as gorgeous as this lobby, I might just move in. An hour later, Nancy and Bess were leaving their suite, which was gorgeous, but now littered with the outfits Bess had tried on and rejected, and heading for the elevator. There were two people going up in the elevator already. One was a chubby man, about five foot seven, who appeared to be in his late twenties, wearing a double-breasted gray suit, black tie, and black alligator loafers. The other was a woman in her fifties, with a pile of brassy blonde hair. Her figure was matchstick thin, and her leopard print mini dress and huge claw-shaped earrings looked much too young for her. He told me Kim was a total slave driver, she was saying in a raspy voice. Probably a chain smoker, Nancy decided. She had barely glanced at the girls as they stepped into the elevator. Half her staffs quit already. I've heard that too, answered the woman's companion. Kim's all smiles for the press, but when no one's around, it's no wonder she has so many enemies. Enemies? Nancy darted a look at Bess. Her, face's, her friend's face was blank, but Nancy could tell that Bess was listening. Well, she's never been too smiley when I've been around, the woman complained. I just can't stand... Oh, here's the 30th floor. As the door slid open, the woman seemed startled that Nancy and Bess were getting off at the same floor, but she quickly recovered and swept down the hall ahead of them. At the end of the hall, the brassy-haired woman jabbed the bell with her thumb, and instantly a heavy-set security guard opened the door. May I help you? he asked in a rumbling bass voice. My name is Luella Teasdale, the woman announced, and this is Oscar Davis, my assistant. We're here to see Kim. Uh, Miss Teasdale and a Mr. Davis, the guard asked the receptionist at a desk behind him. The receptionist scanned her appointment book, then shook her head. Sorry, said the guard, you'll have to call for an appointment. But Kim knows us, sputtered the chubby young man. We're with Fashion Magazine. Suddenly, Nancy remembered where she heard Luella Teasdale's name before. She was get... She was fashion's gossip columnist, and everyone in the fashion world paid attention to the magazine and her. Nancy didn't read it often, but no one who'd read it even once could forget Luella Teasdale's column. Her writing was unbelievably nasty and sometimes clever. Was Miss Teasdale planning a column on Kim? The guard didn't seem to care what magazine she was with. He shook his head again. Kim Daly has never refused to see me, declared the columnist huffily, and she's never needed protection before either. What's going on? The guard stared straight through her. I don't know, ma'am. For a second, Miss Teasdale looked as if she were about to storm past him, but then reconsidered and drew up her shoulders. Come along, Oscar. Something very strange is going on here. She turned and strode away, followed by a perspiring Oscar who was doing his best to keep up. Nancy watched their determined progress down the hall, then turned to the guard. Hi, my name's Nancy Drew, she told him. And this is my friend Bess... Marvin, interrupted the receptionist. Go right in, girls. Miss Daly's expecting you. She waved the girls on past her desk and into instant chaos. The showroom was feverish with activity. Models were being pinned into sample dresses. Assistants were scurrying around with color swatches and fabric samples. In one corner, a woman was frantically sewing black metallic trim onto a silver jumpsuit, and next to her, a harassed-looking man was hanging finished dresses on long racks. And as background to all their activity was the pulsing beat of rock music blaring from hidden speakers. Nancy and Bess threaded their way through the crowd. Passing a row of women sitting at sewing machines, they made their way to an office with Kim Daly's name on the door. As Nancy knocked, the door opened. Kim's office was as chaotic as the showroom. What looked like hundreds of drawings were pinned to the walls, and the desk was buried in sketches, empty coffee cups, piles of fabric, and a box of cloth-covered buttons in every imaginable shade of pink. Nancy wondered how anyone got any work done. Nancy, Bess, come on in, I'm Kim, said the woman behind the desk. She stood up abruptly, knocking a pile of zippers to the floor. Who's who? I'm Nancy, and this is Bess. Kim Daly looked nothing like what Nancy had expected. She wore no makeup except for a smear of bright red lipstick, and she was dressed in black jeans, an oversized black sweatshirt, and sneakers. Her pitch black hair was short and combed forward, and she was wearing long earrings shaped like lobsters. Nancy smiled to herself. Here, she thought, was one of the great forces in teenage fashion, and who would know it? Nice to meet you both. Abruptly, Kim jumped up from her desk and stuck her head into the workroom. Sarah, she shouted, could you come in here right now? In a second, a pale skinny girl appeared. We'd like some um, jasmine tea, Kim told her, and could you find the rest of the cookies? 
and turn off that music. It's driving me crazy. Sarah turned to leave and almost tripped over a tiny Yorkshire terrier yapping its way in to greet Kim. And don't step on Chanel, shouted Kim angrily. That dog is worth two of you at least. You might as well have a seat, girls, Kim continued. Sarah will take forever. Now, listen a second. That's what we were doing, Nancy thought. You've come just in time. I had another of those anonymous calls this morning. And if you don't stop them soon, I'm going to lose my mind. We'll do everything we can, Nancy promised soothingly. What did the caller say this time? The usual, that if I don't look out, I'll be colder than a department store dummy, etc. The fashion industry is cutthroat, but this is ridiculous. Kim's bright hazel eyes flashed with both fear and anger. And you have absolutely no idea who the caller could be? Nancy asked. Of course not. I mean, some people are jealous of me, which is understandable. But this is more than jealousy, isn't it? My staff's devoted to me. Even the press loves me. I haven't had a bad review yet. Well, you certainly love yourself, thought Nancy, but I don't know if you're right about everyone else. Aloud, she asked, what about Luella Teasdale? Luella, Kim exclaimed, you haven't been talking to the press, have you? Of course not, Nancy said evenly. Well, make sure you don't, Kim snapped. Please try to keep this as low key as you can. We'll do our best, Nancy said. Nancy's very good at keeping things quiet, Bess put in loyally, but Kim's eyes were on the door. What could Sarah be doing? Just then, Sarah staggered in with a tray of tea and cookies. Nancy grinned as she watched Bess's eyes light up. As usual, Bess was about to decide to postpone the diet she was just about to start. Put it on my desk, Sarah, Kim ordered. Then her voice softened. Chanel, she cooed. Come up here, honey. From a spot under Kim's desk, the little dog stood up and jumped onto her lap. Want some tea, precious? Kim crooned, pouring some into her saucer. How about a cookie? I know the chocolate ones are your favorite. She plucked the largest cookie from the plate. Beaming, Kim set the saucer of tea on the floor. Chanel sniffed at it and gave it a few dutiful laps before devouring the cookie. Nancy heard Bess stifle a giggle beside her. Now, where was I? Kim asked, straightening up. Oh, yes. About publicity. What is it now, Sarah? Sarah was awkwardly standing in the doorway with a sheaf of papers in her hands. She blushed. Uh, I'm sorry, Kim. I need to get your approval on these. The phone on the desk rang. With a smothered groan, Kim picked it up. Kim Daly, she said in a crisp voice. She listened for a second. Then her eyes widened with terror and she clapped her hand over the mouthpiece. mouthpiece. It's them again, she whispered, switching on the phone's speaker unit so Nancy and Bess could hear. The voice at the other end was hideously distorted. A hissing, demented cackle that, like that of a voice in a nightmare. Say goodbye to your sweet life, Daly. You'll be dead by the end of the week. And this will show that I mean business. An agonizingly shrill scream stabbed the air. Bus doubled over, clutching her head in agony. Kim's little dog ran howling from the room. The scream grew louder, louder, and suddenly a huge crystal paperweight on Kim's desk exploded, shooting deadly shards of glass in every direction. End of chapter one. I'll catch up on chat. Her name is so rude. I'm only going to be gone for a week and make out with like four guys while her anniversary is going on. I'd definitely be at like eight attachments on the skirt. You got to steady back home. <laughs> Alone with Ned, I know. Close the window, come the light, and it will be all right. Oscar is in this. You think Ned and Nancy, he, he you know... Kissed or something? Ah, okay. <laughs> Probably. Oscar's right here. Oscar looks different in emote format compared to how he looks. Luella Deville. <laughs> Not the mouse pee. What are you talking about? <laughs> Thank you for the claps. Look out, Manette's throwing stuff again. Gotta admit, the exploded crystal was pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Oh, did I say mouth pee? Mouse pee? I meant mouthpiece. I'm sorry. My brain is still a little slow. So, reading is not... I'm not at 100% here. <laughs> Alright. Chapter 2. 
Nancy threw herself against Kim, pushing the designer down to the floor and protecting Kim with her body. My eye! I can't see! Sarah screamed from the doorway a second later. Nancy rushed to her. Sarah was doubled over, her hands covering her face. Gently, Nancy lifted her hands away so she could see how badly Sarah had been hurt. Your eyes are okay, she said, but it looks like a pretty deep cut just under the right one, though. Are there any medical supplies here? Sarah shook her head. Bess, please take Sarah down to the lobby, Nancy said. The hotel management should be able to help her. Kim glared at Sarah, her face red with rage. Don't you tell them or anyone what happened, she ordered. It'll ruin my good name, and make sure you get back as fast as you can. We are busy. Bess shot an indignant glance at Kim. Nancy was beginning to see why Kim had enemies. Bess, are you all right? Nancy asked before her friend could say anything to Kim. I think so, said Bess. Kim? Nancy said, and Kim nodded her head yes. Good, said Nancy, running her fingers through her hair to check for shards of glass. You two go down to the lobby. Bess hurried Sarah out the door, and Nancy bent to pick up the glass pieces of glass that lay all over the floor. Oh, don't bother with that, said Kim carelessly. I'll have my sister Morgan do it. There was a light knock at the door. Nancy looked up to see a young woman of about 19 poking her head around the open door. Are you all right, Kim? Asked the woman. I heard a noise. I'm fine, said Kim impatiently, or I will be when Nancy gets to the bottom of this. Nancy, my kid sister Morgan. Morgan, Nancy Drew. She's going to investigate these phone calls. Kim's sister? As Nancy looked more closely, she began to see the resemblance. By anyone's standards, Morgan was the prettier of the two. Her warm chocolate eyes were thick-lashed and her dark hair curled softly around her shoulders. But her tense, strained expression and hunched-over posture made her look unattractive, the kind of person no one would ever look at twice. Nancy couldn't help feeling sorry for her. Hi, Morgan, she said warmly. Do you want a cookie? Oh, Morgan doesn't eat between meals, said Kim. Yes, I do, said Morgan. It's just that I've been dieting. But, Kim, you haven't told me what that noise was. Is everything all right? Everything's fine, Kim snapped. Nancy wondered why Kim was keeping her sister in the dark. What do you have here? What do you have there? Do you want to show me something? Kim went on. Oh, oh, yes, I did. Morgan held up a dress that had been lying over her arm. The seamstress has just finished this. What do you think? Kim tilted her head back. Looks okay, she said after a few seconds of scrutiny. Very nice, actually. Very nice? Kim, it's breathtaking, Nancy marveled. I wish I could afford your clothes. The outfit Morgan was holding was truly gorgeous and much less far out than Kim's usual designs. It was a pearl-colored suit of watered silk with a cropped jacket and slim knee-length and a slim knee-length skirt. A black lacy camisole top peeked out from inside the jacket. Kim smiled, a natural unforced smile that made her seem a lot nicer. This one's for me. I'm going to wear it to my opening. Hey, you look about my size, she said. Would you like to try it on? I'd love to. I'd like to see it on a model. You can change behind that screen in the corner. Morgan, Nancy, and I are going to lunch in a second. Will you phone the restaurant downstairs to let them know we're coming? As Nancy stepped behind the screen, Kim called out, I also designed the ruby pin on the jacket. Nancy took a closer look at the pin. Its deep red stone was set in a simple silver frame. It's beautiful, is it real? She called back. Of course not, answered Kim, but you'd never know, would you? I wouldn't. Nancy stepped into the skirt and pulled it up around her hips. It fit perfectly, just as Kim had predicted. She slipped the camisole and jacket on, marveling at the lustrous feel of the silk against her skin. The clasp on the pin hadn't been secured, and it pricked her a little, but fortunately didn't draw blood. Nancy closed the clasp carefully and stepped out from behind the screen. "'Hey, it looks great on you!' exclaimed Kim. "'And you look great in it! I may have to let you wear it in next week's show!' Nancy turned to face the full-length mirror behind her. Kim was right, the outfit was incredibly flattering. It made her look totally sophisticated." Now I know what looking like a million bucks actually feels like, she said. I'll just have to get one of these someday. Well, until then, how'd you like to wear it to lunch? Suggested Kim. You're sure? What if I spill soup on it or something? You won't, answered Kim. And believe me, it'll good be good publi It'll be good publicity for me if you wear it. Just make sure you tell anyone who asks that I designed it. On their way to the restaurant, they passed the manager's office as Bess and Sarah were leaving. Bess gasped out loud when she saw Nancy. You look great! I'd kill for that outfit! Don't get too carried away, said Nancy, smiling. How are you, Sarah? Fine, muttered Sarah, gently touching the bandage under her eyes. I better get upstairs, she added, glancing at Kim. Thanks a lot, Bess, she hurried away. Bess, you might as well come along with us, said Kim. There's no sense in your hanging around upstairs. Kim, I've been trying to reach you. Kim, Nancy, and Bess turned to see a handsome young man striding toward them, his dark eyes fixed on Kim's face. 
You've got more security than the President of the United States, he said. Your secretary won't put a call through to you, your sister won't put in a call through to you, and when I tried to get in to see you, I was stopped by a guard in a uniform. What is going on? Kim looked away. It's just the security for my show, she said, her eyes averted. I don't want my design stolen. You know what it's like in this business. But you're not worried about me, are you? There was an eager expression in the man's eyes that made Nancy feel as if they, she should leave the two of them alone. If you two need to talk, Kim, Bess and I can meet you, she suggested. N no, no, that's okay, Kim said quickly. Nancy wondered why she sounded so flustered. Oh, I should introduce you, Kim went on. Uh, this is Paul Lavelle. Paul, say hello to Bess Marvin and Nancy Drew. Hello to Bess Marvin and Nancy Drew, said Paul with a broad grin. And hello to Kim Daly. By the way, what are you doing for lunch, Kim? Having it with Nancy and Bess, Kim said bluntly. Nice to see you, Paul. Now I do have to be running along. She took both Bess and Nancy by the arm and led them toward the restaurant, moving so fast she was almost running. Nancy cast a fleeting glance back at Paul, who was staring so hard at Kim that he didn't even notice Nancy. He looked hurt or confused and angry. Is Paul a friend of yours, Kim? She asked in a low voice as they reached the restaurant entrance. Not really. An old boyfriend, that's all, said Kim nonchalantly. Kim Daly, she told the maitre d'. After they were seated, Bess looked around in awe. The restaurant certainly was beautiful. Potted palm plants were everywhere, filling the room with splashes of green. A miniature waterfall cascaded down one wall into a crystalline fish pond, and there were arrangements of brilliant tropical flowers on every table. Caesar salad for me, Kim told the waiter, and a mineral water. I'll have a tossed salad, said Nancy. For some reason, I'm not very hungry. Uh, Bess, what are you having? Oh, um, a salad too, I guess, Bess said reluctantly. No, wait, make that, um, turkey on croissant and a side order of fries and a chocolate shake, because you only live once? The minute the waiter had taken the menus away, Kim's eyes began darting around the restaurant. Looks as though everyone I know is here today, she leaned in and told Nancy and Bess. Can you tell us about a few of them? asked Nancy. Well, that's Apollo over there having lunch with his agent. He's one of the city's top male models. Kim gestured toward a young man with intense dark eyes and a shock of long black long black hair. He was listening with a patient expression to a middle-aged woman sitting with him. And over there is the fashion writer from the Times. She always wears the newest Japanese stuff. The editor was dressed in a gray coat dress as shapeless as a paper bag. And there are Oscar Davis and Louia T Lo There are Oscar Davis and Luella Teasdale from Fashion. Kim gestured toward another corner table where Luella and Oscar were picking at their food. Those two would love to see me fall on my face, Kim continued. Why? asked Nancy suspiciously. It makes better copy for the magazine, I guess, Kim said bitterly. And take a peek at the table in the middle of the room. You see that woman with the spiked hair? How could anyone miss her? asked Bess. It wasn't only the spiked hair. The woman was dressed in a tight leather suit that had been dyed traffic light yellow, and she was wearing ankle-high boots to match. She had on too much makeup, and her laugh rose raucously above all the other noise in the restaurant. That's Lena Roccaccini, the designer, said Kim. She always sits where everyone will see her. She's got a suite here in the hotel, too, the little copycat. Oh, she saw me. Uh, hi, darling, Kim called to Lena, waving her napkin. Lena waved back just as effusively. Hello, sweetheart, she called. Both women were obviously pretending there was no rivalry between them. With an effort, Nancy took her eyes off Lena. I must be hungry, she told herself. That's why it's so hard to concentrate. She took a drink of ice water, hoping to wake herself up. Kim, she said, with your permission, I'd like to call the police right after lunch. We should have them analyze whatever made that paperweight explode. No way, said Kim emph emphatically. Once the police know, there is no way to keep this thing quiet, and I don't want any negative publicity before this show. But your life is in danger, Nancy protested. Don't you want to... She broke off as the waiter reached their table. With a flourish, he placed a beautifully composed plate of greens in front of her. Thanks, Nancy told him. It looks great. But what she was actually thinking was that she had no appetite at all. I wonder if I'm coming down with something, she thought as she reluctantly picked up her fork. The fork seemed so he heavy. Now, what had they been talking about before the food had come? Nancy tried to remember. Something about Kim, her show. Nancy's head was starting to ache. Aren't you hungry, Nan? Asked Bess between bites of her sandwich. Um, uh, sure, Nancy said slowly. It's just that it's so cold in here. Shivering, she rubbed her arms to warm them. What is that ringing sound? Now both Kim and Bess were staring at her in alarm. 
I don't hear any ringing, said Kim. Are you okay, Nancy? I'll be fine if you make them stop that ringing, Nancy gasped. It is hurting my head. She was racked with chills now, and the persistent ringing in her ears was growing louder and louder, unbearably loud. Nancy stood up and took one step before she moaned once and crumpled to the floor. Darkness closed in on her. End of chapter two. I like Minette a little bit more than Kim. <laughs> Hashtag mouse bee gang, stop it. It's like the Otter Mickey Mouse Club. Dave? Is that who you thought the boyfriend was gonna be? Um, I hope Zoo is the culprit. Yeah, same. Paul is Dieter. Zoo, my love, Jing. Nancy got drugged, or Nancy took drugs. <laughs> Cos model. Beautiful. Thank you. Because <laughs> not only did Nancy lie to steal JJ's identity, but what Zoo got looked like Zoom Ilhavidging. <laughs> Darkness closed in on her. I believe in a thing called love. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like my hair is a little frizzy. Hi, Zeus. What you doing? You gonna come up here on the bed? Okay, bye. <laughs> yeah, you're a full-time model. Garrett. Shall we continue? <laughs> it's hard being a knockout all day. You would know. You would know. You gonna get up on the bed? So the people can see you? Hi, people. Look, it's Zeus. He's finally gonna go home to his mom and dad this weekend. Cause they're finally in their new house. Why? Okay. <laughs> what? I don't have anything for you, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> Zeus, take over the reading. Okay, you can read, right? And also speak English. Sit down. Good boy. Chapter three. <laughs> that sneeze scared me. Chapter three. A foot above Nancy, a face floated in midair. Nancy blinked and the face became Bess's. Bess's wide blue eyes were terrified. Oh, thank heavens you're awake, she gasped. I was so worried. Someone's gone to call an ambulance. I don't need one, Nancy gasped, struggling to sit up. As she did, she noticed the ring of worried-looking people hovering behind Bess. I must have some kind of virus, I, I, but I don't need to go to the hospital if someone could just help me up to my room. Well, we can do that if it's what you really want, said Bess, but I hate to let this go without calling a doctor, Nan. Are you sure you're okay? Nancy was not sure. Her head still felt as if it were about to split open, and she was very shaky but at least the horrible ringing sound seemed to have subsided. I'll be fine once I get a nap, she said, forcing herself to smile. I hope so anyway, she added to herself. Nancy didn't quite know how she got back to her room. She only had a vague memory of being supported by Kim and Bess. In fact, she didn't remember anything until the sound of the telephone jarred her awake. Groping on the bedside table for the phone, she finally managed to find the receiver. She cleared her throat. Hello, she murmured. Nancy? You sound so far away. Did I wake you? It was Ned. Kinda, Nancy said. Hang on a second. Let me find a light switch. What's going on? Asked Ned. Are you asleep? It's not even dark yet. Nancy rolled out of bed and stumbled toward the window. She patted the wall till she found the curtain pull and gave the cord a yank. 
fading November sunshine filtered into the room. Nancy climbed back onto the bed. There, that's better, she said. Anyway, what I'm doing here is sleeping off some sort of virus that kind of attacked me at lunch. Ned laughed. So you're not Superwoman after all? Maybe you just need Superman to fly to your side? Nancy laughed too. Could be. It's been quite a day. Quickly, she filled him in on what had happened since she and Bess had arrived. Sounds pretty exciting, Ned said when she'd finished. I wish I was there. I wish you were here too, Ned. That would drive this bug away for sure. Just then, the door to her room was slowly pushed in and a head of fluffy blonde hair poked around it. Nan, are you awake? It's me, Bess. Nancy nodded and smiled. Ned, I have to go. I'll check in with you as soon as I can. I love you, she said in a lower voice. I love you too, said Ned. Take care of yourself, Nancy. Nancy hung up and looked at her watch. It was almost five o'clock. I can't believe I've been out for four hours, she said to Bess. You were out the second you hit the bed. Are you feeling better? Much better. I'm gonna stay down while we talk, though. Nancy punched her pillow up against the headboard and lay back against it. Tell me everything that happened after you brought me here, she ordered. Bess perched herself on the edge of the bed. Well, Kim and I went back downstairs and had lunch. Mine was grace. great. Uh, oh, you didn't mean every detail, did you? <laughs> Bess grinned at herself. Anyway, that guy Paul Lavelle came in and joined Lena. Then he excused himself and wandered over to our table to talk. You know I have very high standards and think Paul Lavelle is a major hunk. But I think he still likes Kim, even though she says it's all over. I also think that Lena likes him. While he was talking to us, I kept looking over at Lena and she looked really, really mad. Later, Kim told me about told me that Paul's a fabulous photographer, Bess went on. She also said that if things weren't so awkward between them, she'd love to have Paul working for her again. So how'd I do, Miss Detective? Great, Nancy said, already absorbed in her thoughts. I don't see why Paul would threaten Kim, not if he still likes her. Nancy pushed herself up and slowly began to pace the room. I'd like to know more about Lena Roccaccini, she added. She's got motive for sure, said Bess, joining Nancy's musings. But she's almost too obvious. I mean, Lena is successful, so she would jeopardize her success by attempting to blow up the competition. I guess you're right, Bess said. It has to be someone pretty desperate. There was a soft rap on the door. It's open, called Nancy. Come on in. The door swung in silently, and Morgan Daly stepped on the threshold. Uh, hi, she said nervously. I hope I'm not disturbing you, but Kim sent me to see if I could, well, do anything to help. That's nice, said Nancy. I really am fine. Could I ask you a few questions? Morgan nodded. Will you sit down? Nancy gestured toward the armchair. Morgan sat on the edge of the chair and remained awkwardly silent. Could you tell me a little about what you do? Nancy asked. You work mainly for Kim, right? Morgan nodded. Do you like it? Pretty much, said Morgan. I mean, she's so talented that it's really a privilege just to help her. And talented people, well, of course, they're sort of difficult at times, but I'm sure she doesn't mean to be. Uh, difficult, I mean. She broke off blushing. What kind of things do you do for her? Nancy asked. Um, a little of everything. Answer the phone, run errands, make lunch reservations, pay the bills, pick up fabric books, stuff like that, you know? Nancy didn't know exactly, but it, she was starting to get the idea. Kim handled all the fun parts of her business, and Morgan cleaned up all the messes. You don't help with the creative work? Nancy asked just to make sure. Oh, no. Kim doesn't need that kind of help, Morgan said. I just handle the day-to-day -day stuff. It's kind of fun, actually. Hmm, Nancy thought. Morgan sounded too good to be true. Could she actually enjoy all the drudgery? Was it possible she had a secret grudge against Kim? Excuse me. I really have to be getting back upstairs, Morgan said suddenly. Sarah's taking the afternoon off, so I'm doing double work. If you don't need me anymore... Just then, someone rapped sharply on the door, which flew open before Nancy could respond. Kim stormed in, waving a newspaper. First the calls, she said furiously. Then the explosion, and now this? She yanked the paper open and shoved it into Nancy's face. A column had been circled in black. The caption was Entre nous, and the author was Luella Teasdale. If you're not familiar with this trash, said Kim, it's about time you got acquainted with the dirtiest gossip column in the Midwest. Entre nous is French for just between us. All the garbage fit to print by the biggest garbage collector of them all. She began reading in a voice that was staccato with rage. What famous, or should I say infamous, 
high fashion teen designer with the initials KD has been on the receiving end of nasty phone calls? Yes, it's true. The as yet unidentified caller may be a disgruntled customer, but who'd make death threats just because a design was bad? Far more likely that the glamorous KD has been lording it over too many people. She certainly has the reputation for treating some folks pretty shabbily. The high point of this sudsy soap opera came today when somebody exploded a crystal paperweight in KD's office. My advice to KD is, don't look into any more crystal balls. You may have just seen the future, and it's B-A-D. Kim snapped the paper shut and threw it down on the bed. I didn't do it, Morgan said, even though no one had even looked at her. Luella tried to pump me for news. I never said a word. She didn't get a thing out of me, I promise. No one's accusing you, Morgan, said Nancy. Morgan continued as if she hadn't heard. I never even spoke to Oscar. I don't know who could have told them. I'm sure it wasn't any of the models, and I can't believe it was Sarah either. Kim had been looking angrier and angrier as Morgan spoke, and now she exploded. Morgan, shut up! She picked up the paper and rammed it into the wastebasket. I'm gonna ruin whoever leaked this. Abruptly, she broke off and stared at her sister. Morgan, what are you wearing? She asked. Just an old sweater, replied Morgan, edging back into her chair. Not the sweater, snapped Kim. The new jewelry? Nancy followed Kim's gaze. Half hidden under Morgan's collar was a silver and ruby pin exactly like the one Nancy had worn earlier. Nancy didn't know why she hadn't noticed it before. That's a copy of my design, Kim said menacingly. Where did you get it? Morgan stood up and backed away toward the door. Her body was stiff. I found it in a second hand shop during my lunch break today. It, it's just a coincidence, Kim. The words were barely out of her mouth before Kim leaped forward and ripped the pin off Morgan's sweater, unraveling the gray wool into long strings. I bet you copied my design, she said, throwing the pin to the ground. Her face was pale with rage. I know that's what you did. That's what you've always done. Copy everything about me. And before Nancy could stop her, Kim had slapped Morgan hard across the cheek. You'll pay for this, Morgan, she said in a flat, dead voice. I'll make sure that you do. And she turned and strode out of the room. End of chapter three. If Superman were here, I'd probably have to make out with him. He's one of my hall passes after all. You can watch, I guess, Ned. It's open! Case closed. Tabloids never lie. Claps for chapter three. What page are we on? Uh, we just ended on page 33. Oh, are you reading along with me? I would have to punch Kim if she did that. She slapped that sweater off her. Yeah. Okay. Two more chapters today. It'll be a short stream. Chapter four. Morgan stood staring, open-mouthed, at the door her sister had just slammed. Then she took a deep breath and burst into tears. The pin doesn't mean a thing, she wailed. I didn't copy it. It's nothing like Kim's pin anyway. Look for yourself. The design around the stone is completely different. She picked the pin up from the carpet and held it out to Nancy and Bess. As far as Nancy could tell, Morgan's pin was exactly like the one on the outfit Kim had designed. It doesn't look so different to me, Nancy said diplomatically after a second, but I didn't really get much of a chance to look at the other pin. Well, they're really nothing all at all the same, said Morgan with a touch of defiance in her voice, but I suppose Kim will believe I wasn't but I don't suppose Kim will believe I wasn't trying to copy her. She pulled a tissue out of her purse and blew her nose. I better be getting back upstairs, she said. Would you like a soda or something before you go up? Nancy asked. Morgan's face was so tear-stained and splotchy she wanted to give her time to compose herself. I could call room service. Morgan shook her head. Kim won't want me to be late. Thanks, though. Maybe another time. She sounded wistful. Whew, Bess whistled after Morgan had left. Speaking of soap operas, that was a lovely little scene. Poor Morgan. I feel sorry for her too, said Nancy. I mean, Kim definitely overreacted, but how can Morgan keep saying the pins are different? I wouldn't be able to tell them apart if I saw them together. I think something more is going on here than just Kim's being mean to Morgan, but I have no idea what it is. Nancy was feeling better after a snack and was eager to get more information. She and Bess took the elevator down to the newspaper stand in the lobby and bought every paper to find out who else might be printing gossip about Kim Daly. Everyone, it seemed. 
Each fashion columnist has something to say about the calls and the explosion, but none was more vindictive than Bronwyn Weiss at the Chicago Tadler. As Nancy read the Tadler column, Bess peered over her shoulder and shook her head. This one is horrible, she said. I never heard of Bronwyn Weiss. Who is she? Never heard of her either, answered Nancy. She must be new. Someone has it in for Kim Daly, our town's would-be trendy designer of exclusive teen wear, the column began. After a series of threatening phone calls, a possibly incendiary device was planted in Daly's office. Things were such a mess in there, the police could find no sign of the device this afternoon. The police only learned of the explosion after this reporter called to confirm the bomb rumor. The message is clear, though. Kim Daly, get out of the business before it's too late. The only question I have is why did it take this mystery person so long to do what so many have wanted to do since Kim Daly became a star? Bess shuddered. Boy, I never hope... I hope that I never get on Bronwyn Weiss's bad side. I wonder who leaked this story to the press, she added thoughtfully. If we knew that, the whole mystery would probably be solved, Nancy said. Other than you, me, Kim, Sarah, and Morgan, who else had access to the office? Nancy sighed. Everyone on the staff, of course, it's beyond me. Of course, it could all be a publicity stunt. That's what one of these papers hints at, Bess began. No, Nancy answered decisively, setting the stack of papers on the newsstand. It's more than that, I'm sure. What do you say? Let's get out there and start talking to suspects, and I suggest we start with Lena Roccaccini. Okay, said Bess agreeably. Sometimes the obvious suspect is the real villain after all. Nancy laughed. Is that something you read in a fortune cookie? Hey, don't knock fortune cookies, Bess protested. I had one last week that said I'd meet the love of my life before the year is out. Six weeks to go, said Nancy. Good luck. At the information desk in the lobby, they were given the number of Lena's suite, which turned out to be on the 29th floor directly below Kim's. They took the elevator up, and Nancy rapped hard at the door. No answer, just coughing and the scurrying of footprints footsteps from the other side of the door. Nancy knocked again, and a voice finally called out, Just a minute. A long minute later, the door opened, and a plump, round-faced young blonde woman peered out them owlishly from behind huge glasses. May I help you? she asked. My name's Nancy Drew, and this is my associate, Bess Marvin. We'd like to speak with Lena Roccaccini, please. She's, um, she's not really available right now, the young woman said. It's after hours, you know. Do you have an appointment? No, answered Nancy, but it is important. Could I leave her a message? Oh, okay, said the woman. Come on in. You can use the desk. As she waved them inside, Nancy noticed she had a small birthmark, a pinkish spot just above her left eyebrow. I'm Allison Haber, Lena's assistant, the woman told them as Nancy sat down at the desk. I'm sorry I can't be more helpful, but we're kind of busy getting ready for the show. I understand, said Nancy. Quickly, she jotted down a few words on a sheet of hotel stationery. It's very important that I talk to her. Here's my room and my phone number. If you could just have her call me as soon as possible. Just then a side door in the suite flew out, flew open, and Paul Lavelle came barreling out with his arms full of photographs mounted on white cardboard frames. These are all ready to go to the printer, Allison, he began. Then he caught sight of Nancy and Bess and gave a start. Hi, we meet again, he said with a tense smile. How are you? The stack of pictures started to slip out of his arms. Here, Paul, let me take those, said Allison, dashing forward. As Paul handed her the pictures, Allison gazed up at him with such adoration that Nancy was startled. This girl is head over heels in love, she said to herself. Paul didn't seem to notice Allison. He was still staring at boyfriend, staring at Nancy. Are you wondering what Kim's old boyfriend, well, not that old, is doing hanging out with her arch rival? He asked. Not really, said Nancy mildly. What you do is your own business, I guess. Uh, it's a little bit strange that you're here with Kim's competition, but let me explain then, said Paul bitingly. I'm a freelance photographer, and I'm good. I made Kim look good. I mean, I, the way I lit her creations, the way I positioned her models, I think a good deal of her early success was due to me. And then she dumped me, which hurt a lot. Kim and I had a really great relationship, both business-wise and social-wise. His voice trailed off, and Bess glanced uncomfortably at Nancy. You don't have to go into details, Paul, Allison blurted out. These girls are strangers. I'm not going into details, Paul said, his eyes still on Nancy. Anyway, I was very happy with our arrangement, but Kim thought I was trying to dominate her life. He turned away and stared out the window. From her point of view, falling in love meant losing control, so she dumped me. Her loss, said Allison, and then turned beet red. Again, Paul paid no attention to Allison. Well, he said with a sigh, a guy's got to make a living. So I signed on with Lena, and we're both delighted with the arrangement, he added more cheerfully. Lena really cares about what I think, unlike Kim. I couldn't be happier. Nancy wasn't sure how true that was, but she didn't say anything. 
She was wondering whether Lena was in this suite or not. Someone was certainly walking around behind the door of the inner office. She could hear quick footsteps pacing back and forth. Was it Lena? And were these two protecting her, or was she afraid to come out? Allison's voice broke into Nancy's thoughts. You look tired, Paul, she said gently. Can I get you something? A mineral water? Juice? She looked so lovesick that Nancy almost felt embarrassed for her. No thanks, honey, said Paul with genuine kindness in his voice. That's nice of you, though. Allison's eyes lit up, and again she blushed dark red. But her face fell at Paul's next words. You looked great in that dress of Kim's, Nancy, he said. You know, you really should think about modeling some Alina's clothes. They'd look fabulous on you. Here, let me show you a few of her designs. No, Allison called out. No one's allowed to see the designs, not before the show. Paul gently put a hand on Allison's shoulder and she flinched as if she'd been burned. These girls aren't spies, Allison, he said. Don't worry, it won't do any harm. Lena's gonna be mad, Allison said nervously. There's nothing for her to be mad about. Nancy's not out to get her. Now, why don't you be a good girl and run those picks out to the printers? They're keeping the shop open late for us. For a second, it looked as though Allison was going to say something more. Then she sighed and picked up the stack of photographs. Okay, Paul, she said quietly and left the suite. Paul grinned. She's nice, but she tends to take life a little too seriously. Here, let me take, let me get those sketches. As he went out, Nancy took a quick glance around the room and was surprised. One corner was filled with electronics equipment, microphones, an elaborate tape deck, and lots of recording equipment. Nancy strolled over to get a closer look. What? She thought. One of the pieces of equipment was a voice distortion apparatus. She'd seen one just like it on a TV show about how special effects were produced. And here, in this makeshift fashion studio, was a similar voice-changing machine. What possible use could Lena have for this electronic equipment? Unless... Excuse me, Paul, Nancy began, but what do you use this vocoder for? Just as she reached over to inspect it more closely, Paul grabbed her by the elbow and violently yanked her away. Hey, don't touch. That's expensive stuff, he said. She wasn't touching anything, Bess said indignantly. She's right, Paul, Nancy said, rubbing her arm. I just wanted to look. I'm really sorry I overreacted, said Paul sheepishly, but that's very delicate equipment. If anything were to happen to it, Lena would take it out of my paycheck. I'm sure you could understand. He glanced at his watch. Look, he added suddenly, would it be okay if I showed you those sketches another time? I've really got to get back to work. I'll tell Lena you came by, and I'm sure she'll call you. Can you let yourselves out? As he talked, his eyes kept straying to the vocoder, and Nancy had the feeling she knew why. Of course, Paul, she said smoothly. We understand. Thanks for your help. What help? Bess snorted once they were safely out in the hotel corridor again. All he did was blab about Kim and kick us out, and I was really beginning to like the guy, too. So much for my taste in men, and so much for fortune cookies. Oh, I'm sure he helped more than he knew, Nancy said. I'm sure that's the, that that's the vocoder that's being used to distort the voices on those calls to Kim, and Paul didn't want me to know anything about it. That means... He made those calls? Bess asked. Maybe. Or maybe he knows some other reason why the vocoder shouldn't be seen. Either way, he gave himself away in there. What time is it anyway? She asked. I left my watch back in our room. Bess checked her watch. 6.30... Dinner time? She asked hopefully. Nancy chuckled. Getting there anyway. I'd just like to go up to Kim's suite first and see if she's there. Let's take the stairs. Just one floor. At the top of the flight, Nancy paused. I gotta catch my breath, she panted. Those steps are steeper than I thought. She sighed in exasperation. I guess whatever I caught hasn't gone away yet. Nan, are you sure you're okay? Bess asked in a worried voice. It's not like you to get shaky from a few stairs. I'm fine now, Nancy said after a second. She opened the door to Kim's floor. Let's go in. At that moment, a terrible scream echoed up and down the corridor. A bone-chilling shriek of pure terror that increased in volume as the seconds passed. Oh no, she's dying! The wail changed from one note to words. Nancy raced down the corridor as fast as she could. Hurry, Bess, she gasped. It's coming from Kim's suite. Something terrible must have happened. End of chapter four. Kind of weird they described him that way. Staring at boyfriend. That was just me skipping a line when I was reading. You know what? I'ma say it. Bess is probably prettier than Nancy. Nancy's just looser. <laughs> okay, Paul, why don't you be a good girl? <laughs> Thank you for the claps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm.
-hmm. We have one more chapter. Okay. Reposition the cozy. Shall we go into the last chapter for today? Okay. <clears throat> chapter five. Help someone, please help! The cries for help grew more and more panicky as Nancy and Bess approached the open door to Kim's suite. The guard was gone. He had joined a small cluster of frightened looking people standing just outside the entrance to Kim's office. Kim was inside the office screaming. Nancy and Bess pushed their way into the office. They stopped short. Kim was kneeling on the floor next to her dog. The dog was lying motionless, her back arched stiffly and her legs straight out in front of her. Her sides were heaving and her brown eyes were filled with fear as they looked beseechingly up at Kim. Chanel! Chanel, what happened to her? Kim was in tears. She saw Nancy and scrambled to her feet. Thank goodness you're here. I, I think Chanel's had a stroke or something. Where's Morgan? Has she called the animal hospital? Why do I have to do everything myself? A breathless Morgan appeared at the door. They're on their way, she said and stepped back outside. Please let them get here soon, Kim moaned. Nancy put a soothing hand on Kim's shoulder. I'm sure they're coming as fast as they can. Why don't you tell me what happened while we wait? I don't really know what happened, Kim said. I was making a cup of tea. When Chanel saw me stirring it, she came running for a taste. She loves tea. Kim's eyes filled with tears. So I gave her a little bit in her dish, then the phone rang, and when I hung up, the tea was gone, and Chanel was like this. She gestured toward the floor. Did you drink any of the tea? Nancy asked immediately. No, I didn't have a chance. I accidentally knocked over the cup and broke it when I answered the phone. Her expression changed. You think Chanel's been poisoned? It looks as though she might have been, said Nancy. You mean if I drunk that tea, I might have been poisoned too? Yes, if it was poisoned. Let's wait and see. Where are the pieces of the cup? I don't know, said Kim, momentarily distracted from her grief. I, I broke it when I answered the phone and someone must have cleaned it up while I was talking. She looked up into her wastebasket. Wait, this has been emptied. Morgan, she yelled. Where's my trash? Again, Morgan appeared at the door. I dumped it down the trash chute, she said. Why? Was that the wrong thing to do? You picked this time to get fastidious? Kim shrieked. Do you realize that now we have no way to check whether there was poison in that tea? Oh, no. Two bright color spots appeared high on Morgan's cheeks. I'm so sorry, she whispered. I, I just wanted to be helpful. Forget it, Kim snapped. It's too late now. Animal ambulance is here, someone said as a young man raced into the room. Quickly, Kim told him what had happened. I'll get to the hospital right away so they can find out what's wrong, he said. The young man scooped the stiff dog and headed out the front door, and all the workers went back to their homes or their jobs. Kim flung herself down at her desk and buried her face in her hands. She's not going to make it, she cried. She looked up at Nancy, her face suddenly savage. You really have to find whoever's doing this. I will, Nancy promised. I've got to, she added to herself, but how long will it be before this person tries to hurt Kim again? There's not much I can do tonight, though, Kim, Nancy added. It's already after seven. Can you take a break? Kim wearily rubbed a hand across her eyes. No, she said dully. We have to keep working. For the next few days, we're going to be totally swamped. At least it'll keep my mind off of Chanel, I hope. Then if there's nothing I can do for you tonight, I think I'll go back to our suite. And collapse, Nancy added to herself. Must be that virus acting up again, she thought. Well, a good night's sleep would just take care of it. But just as she and Bess reached the door, Lena Roccaccini pushed in past them. So she had been in her suite all this time, just as Nancy had suspected. Paul and Allison were right behind her. Who on earth was making all that noise? Lena demanded imperiously. Don't you know some of us have work to do? It's impossible to concentrate with all the yammering in here. Really, Kim, you should try to keep your staff under control. Kim looked as if she were about to explode, but with a visible effort, she swallowed whatever she'd been about to say. I'm afraid I was the one doing the yammering, darling, she told Lena in a silky voice. I'm sorry to disturb you. We had a bit of an emergency here, but it's all taken care of now, and it has been for the past ten minutes, she added, letting Lena know she had taken a long time going up one flight of stairs. Another emergency? Lena asked. What happened this time? Another bomb? We think her dog was poisoned, Morgan burst out. Lena looked a little ashamed of herself. Your dog? I'm sorry to hear that, she said awkwardly. Then she seemed to recover herself. Well, see you around, she continued. Come on, Paul, Allison, maybe we'll be able to get something done now that all the noise is over. She walked out, followed by Allison and a sheepish-looking Paul. 
Nancy nodded to Bess and they followed Lena out the door. Nancy stayed as close to Lena as she could, hoping she might overhear something, and she did. If you ask me, they poisoned the wrong animal, Lena was muttering. That is a horrible thing to say, Paul burst out. It's disgusting the way Kim would use any gimmick to get attention. I just wish she'd die and leave the rest of the fashion world in peace. Paul stopped short. What are you saying, Lena? He asked, astounded. You do not sound like yourself. I know you're a prima donna, but you're taking it a bit far, don't you think? Lena looked as though Paul had hit her. I didn't mean it. Really, I didn't, she exclaimed. You're right, Paul. I went overboard. She just really, really gets on my nerves. She took his hand. Thanks for blowing the whistle. Let's just forget about it, Paul muttered, pulling free and turning toward the stairs. I overreacted too. It's just that, well, as I said, let's just forget about it. Allison had been completely silent during this exchange. She'd just been drifting along next to Paul, and now for the first time she spoke. I think I'll take a walk, she said. A walk? But it's dark and it's freezing out there, Lena exclaimed. Allison didn't meet her boss's eye. I'll be all right, she said. I won't take long. I just, I just need to get some air. Nancy wondered if what was really bothering Allison was the fact that Paul had defended Kim so ardently. It was kind of sad, she thought, that no one seemed to pay any attention to Allison. Like Morgan, Allison was completely overshadowed by her boss. I'll see you later, Allison said in a choked voice and hurried down the hall toward the elevators. I wonder if she's all right. Just then, Lena noticed Nancy for the first time. Oh, hi, she exclaimed. I didn't see you. You're the ones who were having lunch with Kim today, weren't you? Then her voice sharpened. Why are you following me? We just left at the same time you did, Nancy said evenly. I am investigating these threats and attempts to kill Kim. I left a message in your suite. Oh, that was you? Lena interrupted. Well, I'd be happy to talk to you, but I've got to get back to work tonight. Tomorrow would work a little better for me. Would that be okay? Would that be okay? Lena repeated. Nancy didn't answer. She had noticed a pin on Lena's scarf. A silver pin with a ruby at its center. A pin just like the one Morgan Daly had been wearing, and just like the one-of-a-kind pin Kim had designed. Where had Lena gotten it? Nancy met Lena's eyes. What's the matter? Lena asked. Nothing, Nancy said. How could I have been so obvious, she wondered. I must be even more tired than I thought. Lena was looking wary now. You're not a spy, are you? She asked with an attempt at a laugh. Did Kim send you or are you working for some other designer? I promise we're nothing of the sort. Oh, sure, Lena interrupted. That's why you just happened to turn up before the show. Suddenly she turned and bolted through the stairwell door. Lena, where are you going? Paul called down after her. To call security, Lena shot back. I want those two girls thrown out of the hotel. End of chapter five. It should have been the person, I know. Whoa, arrest her! Who, Morgan? Thank you for the claps. All right. Well, it's been a very short stream. Hi, Oscar. How you doing? Good to see you. It was a very short stream, but I'm really glad that we did it today. I apologize for it being so short, but, you know. Tis what it is. It's better for my brain to read than to try to solve puzzles today. So, you know. We got... Get, uh, we got book progress done, so all the people on the on the YouTubes will be happy. Thank you for shouting out, uh, Oscar. I appreciate it. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for shouting out Christy. I'm doing pretty good as well. Um, and Garrett, thank you for shouting out Garrett. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the day and a run wonderful rest of the week. I know the weekend is coming up. Uh, next week, I may be streaming with Holland, but she also has a lot of stuff going on, so we may not be able to work it out together to spend any time together next week. So if I don't stream with Holland next week, then I'll be doing um, probably one stream on my own and then try to coordinate with Tara and Britt to stream for next week. So hopefully we'll see you guys then for that. Um, YouTube people be like, why aren't you reading for longer? I know. <laughs> They're usually nice. They just ask a lot. Like, when are you going to read some more? You know? And I'm like, please just be patient. Um, so thank you, YouTube people that have been patient. Um, I'm really trying my best with my life and trying to balance all of the pieces of my life currently. And so, I just appreciate your patience, for sure. 
have a good rest of the day, everybody. I'll see you again soon, hopefully. Uh, take care of yourselves. Much love. And I'll see you later. Bye-bye.